Welcome to Orbital Dynamics. In this part, I'm going to teach you equations for an ellipse. They are fundamental to orbital dynamics. I'm not only going to teach you the equations, I'm going to show you how they're derived algebraically. In part two, I talked about polar coordinates. Well, it's the preferred coordinate system for orbital dynamics. Everything always comes down to rectangular coordinates. The equations for orbital dynamics start in polar coordinates, and then as a last step, we convert to rectangular coordinates. Orbital dynamics is much more intuitive in polar coordinates. Plotting points on a grid is much more intuitive in rectangular coordinates. The algebraic derivations go the other way around. We start with equations in rectangular coordinates and then derive equations in polar coordinates. To review part two, rectangular coordinates are in the xy coordinate system. Polar coordinates are a combination of angle and length. They plot vectors. This is the equation for a circle in rectangular coordinates. Any values of x and y that satisfy this equation will give you a circle with radius r. I'm not going to derive this equation. It falls out from the Pythagorean theorem. If you want to move the center of the circle off the origin of the xy coordinate axes, you, you would subtract a from x and b from y. This animation shows you how this equation works. 225 is 15 squared. The circle starts centered at the 0, 0 point. Here's what it looks like when you move the circle off center. You subtract a value from x to move the circle to the right, and you subtract a value from y to move the circle up. In part two, I showed you how to transform coordinates from polar coordinates to rectangular coordinates. I want to review that again. Let's draw a position vector from the origin to a point P. This is the vector notation for the position vector R. The length of that vector is expressed this way. A non-bolded r is a scalar and is the length of r. The vector notation of r in vertical brackets is also a scalar and is the length of the vector r. The bold form of r implies both a length and a direction. When I get into physics, I'll explain to you that velocity is a vector and speed is a scalar. Your speed might be 60 miles per hour. Your velocity would be 60 miles per hour heading north. This vector forms an angle with a horizontal axis. We use theta by convention. The polar coordinates for this point are r and theta. I can also express the coordinates this way. You don't actually see much of this notation in orbital dynamics. We use theta and r separately. This is the x component of our point P, and this is the y component. The length of this line segment is r cosine theta. The length is the value of the x coordinate. The length of this segment is r sine theta. This is the value of the y coordinate. Hence, x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. These are rectangular coordinates for p, x and y. If we substitute r cosine theta for x and r sine theta for y, you get these coordinates. This is how we transform from polar coordinates to rectangular coordinates. If we want to know the length of r for a given theta, we write the formula this way. This says that r of theta equals r. That's the formula using polar coordinates for a circle of radius r. The formula for r of theta is usually a function of theta. This is an example. Here's another one. This formula is of special interest to us. It says r of theta equals a times 1 minus e squared over 1 plus e cosine theta. E in this case is the eccentricity, A is the semi-major axis. Theta runs from 0 to 2 pi radians. 2 pi radians equates to 360 degrees. It's one rotation around the circle. 4 pi radians is a valid angle, but it's two rotations. We usually rotate through 2 pi radians and then go back to 0. This is the formula I'm ultimately going to derive from you, for you. It's very common in orbital dynamics. These other three equations are just to show you that for equations in polar coordinates, r is usually a function of theta. You can do this the other way around where theta is a function of r. In orbital dynamics, we typically know the angle of the orbiting body and want to plot its path. r tells us how far the body is away from the origin. I'm going to show you how to offset the origin in polar coordinates. Let's start with the equation for a circle in rectangular coordinates with the a and b terms. The circle is offset to the point AB. 
I first divide both sides by r squared. I derive this trig identity in an earlier part, cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. I now have two equations that equal 1. Let's say that sine squared theta equals y minus b squared over r squared. I'm doing this arbitrarily. If that's the case, then cosine squared theta will equal x minus a squared over r squared. I can take the square root of both sides of the first equation to get sine theta equals y minus b over r. I can do the same for the other equation. Cosine theta now equals x minus a over r. In the first equation, let's multiply both sides by r. We'll do that the same for the second equation. By solving for y, we get that y equals r sine theta plus b. Likewise, solving for x gives x equals r cosine theta plus a. Here's an animation that shows how this equation works. The animation switches between t and theta, but they both are synonymous. In orbital dynamics, we often start with circles and then transition to ellipses. Here are equations for a circle in rectangular coordinates. Now I'm going to show you an equation for an ellipse in rectangular coordinates. Let's start with the equation for a circle in rectangular coordinates. r squared equals x squared plus y squared. Any values of x and y that satisfy this equation results in a circle. In the second equation, any values of x and y that satisfy this equation results in a circle centered at points a and b. If we rearrange the basic equation for a circle, we can express it as x squared plus y squared equals r squared. We can divide both sides by r squared, and we can put r squared under x squared and y squared separately. Here's another way to express that. The equation for an ellipse is x over a squared plus y over b squared equals 1. a is a semi-major axis, b is a semi-minor axis. The form of this equation looks similar to the equation above for a circle. In fact, a circle is one instance of an ellipse where the length of the semi-major axis equals the length of the semi-minor axis. Here, I'm adding back in the a comma b offset for the equation for a circle. Here's what that looks like for an ellipse. The offset here is h and k since I use a for the semi-major axis and b for the semi-minor axis. This isn't a formal derivation. I derive these equations for ellipses intuitively. I'll show you the formal derivation next. In order to do that, I need to derive the distance formula. I'll need it for the derivation I'm about to show you. Let's say we wanted to know the distance of the blue hypotenuse on this triangle. According to the Pythagorean theorem, AB squared equals AC squared plus BC squared. AB thus equals the square root of AC squared plus BC squared. I'm ignoring the negative value of this square root. The length of AC is trivial. It's the difference of the x-coordinate of C and the x-coordinate of A. The y-coordinates are equal, so their difference would be equal to zero. The length of BC is also trivial. It's the difference of the y-coordinate for B minus the y-coordinate for C. I put absolute value bars around these quantities in case x2 was less than x1 or y2 was less than y1. The length of AB is thus equal to the square root of x sub 1 minus the square root of x sub 2 minus x sub 1 squared plus y sub 2 minus y sub 1 squared. And here I don't need the absolute value bars because I'm squaring each of the differences. This is the distance formula. Here's an ellipse and a point x comma y on the ellipse. With respect to the center, the horizontal vertices are distance a away along the major axis, and the vertical vertices are distance b away along the minor axis. C is the distance to the focus. The line segments from the point x comma y and the focus points are d sub 1 and d sub 2. I showed you in the previous part that a squared equals b squared plus c squared. The semi-major axis squared equals the semi-minor axis squared plus the distance to the focus squared. That means the b squared equals a squared minus c squared. I simply subtracted c squared from both sides and reversed the equation. Using the distance formula, the length of d1 equals the square root of x minus minus c squared plus y minus 0 squared. If I drop this perpendicular down from x comma y, that's the x2, y1 point in the distance formula. Since this point is on the x-axis, the y value is 0. 
I can clean up this equation a bit since minus minus c is plus c and y minus zero is y. What results is the square root of x plus c squared plus y squared. The distance d2 is the square root of x minus c squared plus y minus zero squared. That can be simplified to the square root of x minus x squared, x minus c squared plus y squared. When I showed you how an ellipse is constructed, I said that d1 plus d2 equals 2a. The sum of the lengths of the two segments, d1 and d2, for any point x, y on the ellipse equals the length of the major axis, which is two times the semi-major axis a. I can substitute the distance equations for d1 and d2 into this, this equation. The square root of x plus c squared plus y squared plus the square root of x minus c squared plus y squared equals 2a. Let's subtract the square root of x minus c squared plus y squared from both sides. Now I'll square both sides. The side on the left is easy. You just remove the radical and you get x plus c squared plus y squared. Do you remember this algebraic identity? x minus c squared equals x squared minus 2cx plus c squared. If we apply that identity to the right hand side of the equation, we get 4a squared minus 4a times the square root of x minus c squared plus y squared plus x minus c squared plus y squared. Here's another identity, x plus c squared equals x squared plus 2cx plus c squared. We can use that to expand the left-hand side of this equation. What results is x squared plus 2cx plus c squared plus y squared on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, I'll expand x minus c squared. That equals x squared minus 2cx plus c squared. There's an x squared here and here. Those will cancel. There's a c squared here and a c squared here. Those also will cancel. And there's a y squared here and a y squared here. Those will cancel too. This simplifies to 2cx equals 4a squared minus 4a times the square root of x minus c squared plus y squared plus minus 2cx. There's a 2cx here and a minus 2cx here. If I add 2cx to both sides, I get 4cx. If I subtract 4a squared from both sides, I get minus 4a squared on the left. What remains on the right is minus 4a times the square root of x minus c squared plus y squared. I can divide both sides by 4. I'll square the sides again. The square of a squared minus cx is a to the fourth minus 2a squared cx minus c squared um, x squared. And that equals a squared times x minus c squared plus y squared. Here I'm expanding x minus c squared. The left-hand side is the same. The right-hand side is a squared times x squared minus 2cx plus c squared plus y squared. On the right-hand side, I can multiply all the terms in the parentheses by a squared. There's a minus 2a squared cx here and a minus 2a squared cx here. Those will cancel. And I'm left with this a to the fourth minus c squared x squared equals a squared x squared plus a squared c squared plus a squared y squared. Here I'm reversing that equation. And here I'm factoring out x squared from the first two terms on the left and a squared from the first two terms on the right. Now we're going to make use of this equation. Here, I've substituted b squared for a squared minus c squared. Now, b squared times x squared plus a squared times y squared equals b squared times a squared. Now, let's divide both sides of the equation by b squared. b squared x squared over b squared equals x squared. And on the right-hand side, b squared times a squared over b squared equals a squared. Now, let's multiply both sides of the equation by a squared over a squared. I'm sorry, let's multiply both sides of the equation by 1 over a squared. a squared y squared over b squared a squared equals y squared over b squared, and a squared over a squared equals 1. This is the equation for an ellipse in rectangular coordinates.
Here's how that equation works. If I change the semi-major axis, the term under x changes. If I change the semi-minor axis, the term under y changes. If I move the center of the ellipse, I either add or subtract a value from x or y. Notice that if I move the ellipse to the left, to the left I'll add a value to x. We're ultimately going to want to shift the ellipse so the right focus is at the origin of the coordinate system. We'll do that by adding the length of the focus to x in this equation. I showed you earlier the formula for a circle and polar coordinates. Here's what it is. We can set up a similar equation for an ellipse. Instead of r cosine theta and r sine theta, it's a cosine theta and b sine theta. Here's how that equation works for both a circle and an ellipse. Here the semi-major axis is 2 and the semi-minor axis is 1. The radius of the circle is 1. The equation for the circle is fine. The equation for the ellipse results in the right shape, but notice that the point on the ellipse doesn't correspond to the angle t. They use t in these animations while we prefer to use theta. I wanted to show you this so you'd understand that this equation will result in ellipse, but doesn't otherwise work for orbital dynamics. By the time we get to the end of this part, I'll give you the proper equation. Ultimately, we need to be able to plot points on an ellipse so we can draw the path of an orbiting body. I prefer to set up simulations so I can see the predicted motions. After all, this is orbital dynamics. Decades ago, we had to use our imaginations, pencil, and paper. Now with today's technology, we can do really cool animations. I mentioned that I use Sketchpad a lot for a lot of the geometric constructions. I'm going to show you how we can set up animations in Sketchpad. This isn't my favorite use of Sketchpad. I prefer to use Python for animations that involve more complex math. I want to show you this nonetheless. Sketchpad can be good for some simple animations. First, I'll set the units in Sketchpad to radians. And then I'll turn on the grid. Next, I'll set up a parameter for r for the radius and formulas for the x and y coordinates. I'll create a new function. I'll set this to an r equals q of theta function. And then I want to multiply r times the cosine of theta. This defaulted to q of theta, and I want to change that to r. Now I'll set up another function for y. Again, this is an r equals r of theta function, and I want to multiply r times the sine of theta, and then I want to change this label to y. Now, if I plot this parametric curve, I can plot x of theta and y of theta, and I get a circle. If I change the parameter r, I change the radius of the circle. Now I want to set up the animation. So here I'm constructing a circle. And then I draw a line segment on the horizontal. This is a reference line and a line segment above and then I draw this angle and I want to measure this. I, I label this angle theta and this is going to be a counterclockwise angle and now I measure it and I want to call this theta and after a few tries I get this right. That's wrong. And that's the right syntax. Now I'm going to hide these labels. And one of the features of Sketchpad is 
I can animate that point on the circle and rotate it counterclockwise. You can see if I click that button, it rotates the point, all the while measuring the angle P of theta. Now I can graph that angle in polar coordinates. So the length is R and the angle is P of theta. And now I've plotted the point on the reference on the circle I've plotted. Now if I change the radius, it changes both the point and the purple circle. I can also compute a parameter for the x coordinate, r times cosine theta, and a parameter, I can calculate a parameter for the y x coordinate, r times sine of theta. And now I plot these rectangular points, much like I plot of the polar. And now when I animate, the point moves along the circle. This is kind of a silly animation. Sketchpad already provides a circular animation out of the box. I really didn't need to define an R um, and a theta and then derive equations for X and I. I showed you this because if you want to animate a point along an ellipse, you'd construct it this way. And instead of an R, you'd define an A and a B. And then you'd um, substitute A and B for R in the parameters for X and Y. So while you can get simulated motion along an ellipse, I caution you against using Sketchpad for this kind of an animation. You get a point that travels along an ellipse, but the timing will be all wrong. And it's very hard to adjust the timing in Sketchpad. Um, You'll find it much simpler to use Python, which is what I want to show you next. But before that, I do that, for completeness, I want to show you how you do this in Excel. This turns out to be a really painful way to construct an animation, and I don't recommend it, but nonetheless, I want to show it to you anyway. So in Excel, I want to set up a parameter R. And I'm setting this to three. I like to use name references in Excel. So if you go into formulas, click on Korea from selection. Now that cell is called R underscore. Here I want to define a table of values for theta. And I'm computing 2 pi just so I know what it is. So I'm going to fill in values from 0 I'm going to step at 100 to 6.28. That's 2 pi. And those are all my theta values. I like to use tables in Excel. So I'm going to create a table. And the nice thing about tables is if I type a column header here, I'll type X. It adds automatically to the table. And here I'll, have, I'll put Y. So X equals r times cosine of theta. And the trig functions in Excel expect radians. y equals r times the sine of theta. And you can see why I like to use name cell references. The formulas in this table are pretty intuitive. Now, in Excel, I can create a graph that plots these x and y variables. Now, this looks like an ellipse. It should be a circle. That's because the default for Excel is a 3 by 5 chart. So if I get rid of the title and make this a 5 by 5, you get a circle. You've also got to be careful with Excel auto-sizing the axes. So if you want a correct shape, you've got to fix the size of the chart and the dimension of the axes. Now I want to plot a point. So here's another theta and x and y coordinates for a single point. 
And because I like name self-references, I'm going to name that theta, which is different from the theta variable in the table. And then I'll name these x and y. So that is labeled x, that's labeled y. So x equals r times cosine of theta, again. y equals r times sine theta. Now, one thing we need to set up in Excel is, see that tab right there? I already had it enabled, but that's called the developer tab. We're going to need that to create macros, which I'll do here. You click on Visual Basic, then you insert a module, and here I can write code. So the way you do animations in code is we create a subroutine called Advanced Theta. This will be a loop, and I want to go through a thousand iterations. I pick that arbitrarily. This is the end of the loop. And here, I want to take the value that's in the, theta, the cell name theta. And I want to add 0 0.01 to it. So I'm going to be incrementing theta by 1 one hundredth of a radian. Now, I don't want theta to become a huge number. So I'm going to check to see if in that last increment, theta went above 2 pi. Now, I can do it this way, but a more proper way is to use a worksheet function. So application.worksheetfunction.py gives you a pretty accurate representation of pi. So if the value in the cell name theta is greater than 2 pi, then I want to reduce it by 2 pi. And I'm not resetting it to 0. If I did that, the movement along the circle wouldn't be smooth. If theta is some fraction above 2 pi, this will simply subtract 2 pi. And that do events will cause the chart to be updated. Now, I want to plot the x, y values. So I do that by adding this x value to the chart, this y value to the chart. You'll notice that nothing appeared. That's because it defaulted to a line. So if I go into the chart and pick Format Series 2, which is what I just added, and if I change the design, I can change it to a point. And now I have an orange point on the circle. Now if I go into the Developer tab and select Macros, there's the subroutine I just created. And if I click Run, it will advance the point. And now I'm getting circular motion along the plotted path of the orange dot. And that's how I stop. If you hit escape, you can hit the stop button. So if you want to do elliptical motion, you would change the formulas. You use A and B instead of an R. Here I'm just running this again. If you want to change the speed, you would change the increment from 0.01 to something different. 
I find using Excel to do this very cumbersome. So I wanted to show you one way to do animation in Excel. If that's all you have at your disposal, you can make it work. I personally prefer using Python, and I'll show you in a minute how it's much easier. All right, and one last thing. When you save this workbook, you have to save it as a macro-enabled workbook. Otherwise, it'll give you a warning. Here's my preferred method for creating these animations using Python. I showed you how to download Paizo in part two. It's the integrated development environment that I use for Python. And when you download Paizo, it has all the libraries that I use to do these animations. Not only is Python simpler for animating points on ellipses, it's much easier to use when we get into the physics behind orbital dynamics. Here I'm going to show you how to plot a simple circle. I'll open a file in PyZo and I'll call it circle.py. And PY is the extension for Python code. PyZo includes libraries that provide MATLAB-like functions. I need to import those in order to use them. I do that with import statements. NUMPY is a scientific computing package, and matplotlib is a 2D plotting package. And the as statement means I can refer to NUMPY as NP, and matplotlib pyplot as PLT. Here I'm setting up a variable. This is actually an array in the NP A range function lets me specify it as an array from 0 to 2 pi. And I'm adding 0 0.1. Otherwise, if I plot the circle, there's a little gap. So 0 to a little more than 2 pi in 10th radian increments. Here I'm setting up a radius variable equal to 3. And this plt.figure statement defines the figure that I plot into. I'm going to set the figure size to 6 by 6. That ensures that the window will be square. And then here's where I plot the xy coordinates. It's radius times np cosine theta and radius times np sine theta. And because theta is an array of values, I get an array of x's and y's. And plt.show will display the plot. So if I run this, I get a circle. Much simpler than Excel or Sketchpad. So this is a really simple example. Um, Notice how simple the Python statements are. OK, in orbital dynamics, we deal with elliptical orbital paths. So let's start with that code that we just wrote for a circle. And the first thing I want to do is change the name of the file to ellipseexample.py. And then I'll change the radius to b. And I'll add a variable for A. A will be the semi-major axis. B will be the semi-minor axis. I set A to 5 and B to 3. And now the figure size has got to be scaled based on the shape of the ellipse. And now I change the radius for X to A and the radius for Y to B. And now if I run this, I get an ellipse. If I change A and B so they're equal, I get a circle. 
If I change A to 3, it becomes the minor axis. B is the major axis. And I get an ellipse rotated 90 degrees. We need to center the ellipse at one of the focus points. Kepler determined that the orbit, uh, the path of an orbit and body was along an ellipse with the central body located at one of the focus points. This is really simple to do in Python. I'll add a variable f for the focus, and I tend to use f and c interchangeably. It equals the square root of a squared plus b squared. So this is a squared plus I'm sorry, a squared minus b squared. This is a squared minus b squared to the one-half power, which to the one-half power is the square root. And now for the x-coordinate, I simply subtract f. And now the ellipse is centered at the right focus. Okay, plotting the ellipse is great, but it's only the path of the orbiting object. Here I'll show you how to plot the actual object. So I want to set up another variable called mean anomaly, and I'll explain to you later what that means, but it's an angle. And everything we do in orbital dynamics is in radians, but 45 degrees is more intuitive. So I'm going to set that to 45 degrees in radians. And now I'm going to copy the plot statement and add a quote, O oh, quote to it, which will plot a point. So I'm plotting theta in one statement and mean anomaly in another. And notice the green dot on the ellipse. If I change the angle to 90, the green dot shifts. Now, I also like to plot position vectors. So to do that, I'm going to copy the statement I used to plot the point. I'm going to get rid of the O, so that's now going to be a line. And here I'm going to make X and Y two-dimensional arrays. And the first element of each array is zero, so that means the line starts at zero, zero, and the second element are my equations for x and y. So now I have an ellipse, a green point, and a red position vector. And if I change the angle, I get a different point on the ellipse and a different position vector. I mentioned that we prefer to define ellipses with semi-major axis and eccentricity. When we get into the physics behind orbital dynamics, you see a relationship between some of the physical properties in eccentricity as well as some of the physical properties in semi-major axis. In the examples I've shown you thus far, we've been using semi-major axis and semi-minor axis. It's very simple to change this. I'm going to add a variable for eccentricity and give it a value of 0 0.8. And now rather than specifying z, I'd prefer to compute, specifying b, I'd rather compute b. And b is a times 1 minus e squared to the 1 half power, or the square root of 1 minus e squared. And I derived that for you earlier. And then I can leave f the same. Now, if I execute this file, I get the same result. I can simplify the formula for f. I told you before that f equals e times a. So if I have e, I can make this much simpler. And I get the same result. Let's now make this animation dynamic. This is where I show you how to animate the point on the ellipse. 
and a vector as well. First thing I need to do is bring in the animation library from matplotlib. And it's simply called animation. I'm going to delete mean anomaly because I'm going to compute it as part of the animation. And here, I need to assign this figure to a variable so I can refer to it later. And I also need to assign the point to a variable, which I'll call point. And here, because I'm just setting this up, I'm going to make it an empty variable. And I'm going to do the same for the line. And I'm going to assign that to a variable called line. Now, this is the animation routine that's going to be called over and over again. And it passes a mean anomaly parameter. And with this animation routine, I'm going to compute x. It's a times the cosine of the mean anomaly in radians. And then y is b. I'm sorry, I've got to subtract f from a to keep the ellipse centered correctly. And then y is b times the sine of the mean anomaly in radians. And then this is how I set the xy coordinates in the point variable, and how I set the pair of coordinates in the line variable. And then at, the, then at the end of this routine, I need to return point and line. That's the end of the routine. Back in the mainline code, this is the animate function. The figure is fig, which I defined earlier. The function is animate, which I just defined. And then the number of frames, I'm going to set that to 360, which equates to degrees. And the interval is going to be 10 milliseconds. And then this is what happens when you make a mistake in Python. The animation function should have started with animation. Now if I run this, you can see the green dot moves along the ellipse, and the red vector does as well. If I change the interval to 20, it should run twice as slow, although I haven't had good luck with the interval function. When I do this, I'm not so concerned about the exact timing. It's more the relative timing. If you look up ellipses in Wikipedia, they describe a formula for an ellipse centered at the coordinate system origin. This isn't useful in orbital dynamics. However, I want to touch on it briefly so you're familiar with it. I want you to be familiar with it so you know not to use this formula. An ellipse is all the points that satisfy this equation. With these parametric equations, you can get an ellipse centered at the origin. If you subtract f from x, the center will be at the right focus. That's what I did in the Python examples I just showed you. So let's pick a point on the ellipse that corresponds to a cosine t and b sine t. This is our position vector. 
let's draw a horizontal and a vertical line. Here are the x component and y component. And by the Pythagorean theorem, the length r is the square root of a cosine t squared plus b cosine t squared. This is not really r of theta, however, and I'll show you why. Notice how the point on the ellipse doesn't line up with the point on the circle. And I showed you this before. When the position vector is at about 45 degrees to the x-axis, the point on the ellipse is at some angle less than 45 degrees. So in this equation, if you plug in an angle theta, you'll get a point on the ellipse, but it won't correspond to theta. The equation we used before looked like polar coordinates, but the angle theta was off for all but points on the x or y axes. Here we'll derive a proper equation that gives you the right point for values of theta. Here's the equation of rectangular coordinates for an ellipse. Let's pick a point on the ellipse. Let's draw a vector to that point. The angle the vector forms with the x-axis is theta. The length of that vector is r. X is r times the cosine of theta, and y is r times the sine of theta. Now let's plug in these x and y values into the rectangular formula for an ellipse. We ultimately want an equation for r since theta is an input variable. Let's multiply the first term by b over b and the second term by a over a. Now we have a common denominator. We can combine terms and bring out r squared. We want to solve for r, so let's multiply both sides by ab squared and divide by b cosine theta squared plus a sine theta squared. If we then take the square root of both sides, we get this. And that simplifies to ab over the square root of b cosine theta squared plus a sine theta squared. Since we now know r and we previously knew theta, we can use these equations to compute x and y values. While this gives you the correct point for a given angle theta, the ellipse is still centered at the center of the coordinate system. We need to come up with a different formula for an ellipse centered at a focus point. And I'll do that right now. Here's an ellipse with all the points labeled. A is the semi-major axis, B is the semi-minor axis, C is the distance from the center to a focus point. We want a formula in polar coordinates that allows us to construct this position vector R. The angle here is theta. If we use this equation, the center of the ellipse will be centered at the origin of the coordinate system. If we instead use this equation, the right focus of the ellipse will be at the origin of the coordinate system. Here's the equation we're going to derive. In the derivation, we'll also derive this version. This has the left focus centered at the origin. And in orbital dynamics, we prefer to be right centered. A few preliminaries. I've covered this before, but I want to remind you that the semi-major axis squared equals the semi-minor axis squared plus the length of the focus squared. That means that b squared equals a squared minus c squared. Also, remember that the definition of eccentricity depicted as e here is the length of the focus divided by the semi-major axis. That implies that the length to the focus equals a times e. We're going to use these equalities in the derivation I'm about to show you. We use these algebraic identities several times. a minus b squared is a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. And a plus b squared is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. And we'll use this trig identity, cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. In this derivation, we want to get rid of the x and y terms and express everything in polar coordinates. We could start by substituting r cosine theta for x and r sine theta for y. We also want to characterize the ellipse in terms of semi-major axis and eccentricity. Here, I have substituted a squared minus c squared for b squared. And here, I've substituted ae for c. What we ultimately want to get to is a single r on the left-hand side of the equation and a function of theta on the right. We ultimately want to get to this. And I'll show you how we do that. Here's the full derivation. This gets into a lot of algebra, but it's pretty basic. We'll start with the equation for an ellipse centered at the right focus. Let's rearrange this equation a bit before we introduce polar coordinates. Here I substitute 
a squared minus c squared for b squared. And here I substitute AE for C. This equation no longer has a B term, the semi-major axis, nor a C term, the length of the focus. The only remaining terms are the semi-major axis and eccentricity. In the term on the right, I can factor out A squared. A squared minus A squared E squared becomes A squared times one minus E squared. I want both fraction over a common denominator. I do that by multiplying the fraction on the left by one minus E squared over one minus E squared. Now I can add the numerators together. Here I multiply both sides of the equation by a squared times one minus e squared. And now I'm ready to substitute r cosine theta for x and r sine theta for y. There are no longer any x or y terms nor b or c terms. From here, I solve for r. Here I'm expanding the left-hand term r cosine theta plus ae squared. That equals r squared cosine squared theta plus 2 aer cosine theta plus a squared e squared. And the rest of the equation remains the same. Here I'm multiplying the two left-hand terms. I find it easier to do this multiplication in a longhand sort of way. Since the first term in the multiplier is 1, I only need to repeat the terms r squared cosine squared theta plus 2 aer cosine theta plus a squared e squared. And then I multiply each of the terms in the multiplication by minus e squared. That results in minus e squared r squared cosine squared theta minus 2 a e cubed r cosine theta minus a squared e to the fourth. Here's what all that looks like put together. These are the expanded terms I just derived. And here I've expanded the terms on the right a squared times 1 minus e squared becomes a squared minus a squared e squared. I factored out a squared earlier and then factored it back in here. That's the step I could have skipped if I was really fussy about it. There's an e squared, there's an a squared e squared here and a minus a squared e squared here. So if I add a squared e squared to both sides, this term becomes 2 a squared e squared. And here I'm rearranging terms again. This term, r squared sine squared, is moved over here. And if I factor out r, this becomes r squared times cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. And if you recall, cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. So I can make that disappear. And now that very left-hand term is simply r squared. Now I'm taking all these terms and I'm subtracting them from both sides of the equation. So now r squared equals a squared, the term on the right, minus 2 aer cosine theta minus 2 a squared e squared plus e squared r squared cosine squared theta plus 2 ae cubed r cosine theta plus a squared e to the fourth. And that was simply moving all those terms to the right. Here, I'm taking this set of functions and just moving them here. So I'm just rearranging. And now I'm going to factor out a minus er cosine theta. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, these three terms, a squared minus 2 aer cosine theta plus e squared r squared cosine theta equals a minus er cosine theta squared. And that was that algebraic identity I showed you before. a minus b squared equals a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. And that's how I derived that. Now here I'm simply taking these terms and putting them in parentheses. So the plus 2ae cubed r cosine theta becomes minus 2ae cubed r cosine theta. And then here I'm factoring, I'm taking these terms and I'm factoring out 2ae squared. And then here I'm changing a squared e to the fourth to ae squared squared. And I'm doing that because these terms are also another instance of a squared minus 2ab plus b squared, which means r squared equals a minus er cosine theta 
minus ae squared, all of that squared. Now I can take the square root of both sides. That simplifies to r equals a minus e r cosine theta minus a e squared. And I can take away the parentheses around a minus e r cosine theta. And now, since I want to solve for r, I'm going to add e r cosine theta to both sides of the equation. So I get r plus e r cosine theta equals a minus a e squared. I now want to factor r out of the two terms on the left. So r times 1 plus e cosine theta equals a times 1 minus e squared. And now solving for r is pretty straightforward. I simply divide both sides of that equation by 1 plus e cosine theta, and I get the formula that we were after. r equals a times 1 minus e squared over 1 plus e cosine theta. Now, what if we centered the focus, the left focus, of the ellipse. This equation up here on the upper left would be x minus c. And the signs in all of these formulas would change. I'm going to go this, through this fairly quickly. But in this next formula, x plus c turns into x minus c. In the next formula, x plus ae turns into x minus ae. x plus ae again turns into x minus ae. And again, x plus ae turns into x minus ae. Same thing again and again. And now this r cosine theta plus ae turns into r cosine theta minus ae. Now I'm going to do that multiplication. The center term goes from plus 2ae r cosine theta to minus 2ae r cosine theta. And I'll make that same substitution here. In this case, in the left-hand part of this, I get a minus 2ae r cosine theta. In the right-hand part, it's now a plus to ae cubed r cosine theta. And I'll make those two substitutions here. And if you're looking closely, the minus sign and the plus sign are red. So I'll keep changing those signs. I get a minus 2 ae r cosine theta and a plus 2 ae cubed r cosine theta. And do that again here, and again here, and again here, and again here. And now, because I'm moving all these terms to the right of r squared to the right-hand side of the equation, it's now plus 2ae r cosine theta and minus 2ae cubed r cosine theta. And I'll repeat that again. And now, a minus e r cosine theta becomes a plus e r cosine theta. And 2ae cubed r cosine theta is still negative. And now, when I put parentheses around these two terms, 2a cubed e squared, the uh, minus becomes a plus 2a e cubed r cosine theta. And now you can see I've got common terms, a plus e r cosine theta, a plus e r cosine theta. And those factor out. r squared equals a plus e r cosine theta minus a e squared, all that squared. I take the square root. I get rid of the parentheses. And now I need to subtract e r cosine theta from both sides. So it's r minus e r cosine theta equals a minus a e squared. And that's now r times 1 minus e cosine theta equals a times 1 minus e squared. And now the denominator, instead of being 1 plus e cosine theta, is 1 minus e cosine theta. So I just derived the other version of this equation, which puts the, fo puts the left focus at the origin. Okay, that's about all the algebra in this part. Now let's fix the Python code a bit. First thing I want to do is change the formula for the length to the focus to e times a. I did that before, but I'm doing it again. And now I no longer want to use a and b for x and y. I want to use r. So here's the formula for r r equals a times 1 minus e squared. Divided by 1 plus e times 
cosine of theta. So now I change this A to an R. And I no longer need to subtract F and this B to an R. Now in Paizo, I can just execute the selected code and I get an ellipse with the focus centered at the origin. Now I want to change the animation to use R instead of A and B. So I'll copy this formula and this needs to operate on mean anomaly. So I'll copy that. Actually, I'm going to change this to true anomaly. Now that I've got the right polar coordinates, I'm using what's called true anomaly, and I'll explain to you what that means in a later part. And instead of A and B, I want to use R, and I just deleted the minus F. And I've got to make sure I convert true anomaly to radians in the equation for R. Now, if I run this, I get a point traveling along the ellipse and a vector that's connected to the point. Now, you'll notice that the shape is a little linear on the left. That's because I'm now using R instead of A and B. Oh, here I'm changing the interval. So if I want a smoother shape, I can just change the increment for the theta array. If I change it to 100th, Now the shape on the left got a lot smoother. The points being plotted in the animation didn't change. Those are still 360 points. But now theta, instead of being 64 points, is 640, because I increased it by 10. There are a few ways we can make this Python code more modular. First, I want to change theta to theta array because I'd like to use theta as a generic variable. And to make it consistent with the animation, I'm going to express theta in degrees. I'll do 361 for good measure. And I want to increment this by one degree. And so not only do I want to substitute theta array for theta, I need to convert the degrees into radians. And I'll copy this in each of the instances. And if I select this code, I can just run that code. And I still get the right shape. And it's smooth because I have more than 64 points. And the animation actually still works. Now, I wanted to find a routine that computes R. An input variable to this routine will be theta, the angle, and it'll perform this computation. And here I don't want to use theta array, I want to use theta. Here, if I put a hash mark next to the statement, it will make it a comment, so it won't execute. And now, Instead of using the variable r, I want to use the function r. And I'll change that in each of these instances. And if I execute this, I'm still getting the right shape. So I can delete this commented out line. So now that I have a function for r, I can use it in the animate routine. 
So instead of the variable r, I'm going to pass true anomaly to the function r. And then I no longer need this statement. Now if I run the file, I get the same animation. So now I've defined the formula once instead of defining it twice in my code. Defining it twice is dangerous. If I had a mistake and I fixed it in one place, I would still have a mistake. Now I can do better. I want to define a function for x coordinates. That will also take theta as an input. And it will return r of theta times the cosine of theta in radians. And I wanted to find a function for y. And now I can greatly simplify this plot function. I simply say x of theta array. And here I say y of theta array. Now you see what happens when you have a bug in your code. I type u instead of y. So here, if I fix u, Pizer actually tells you what line is wrong. And if I execute this, I get the right shape. Now, the animation function wasn't changed, and it wasn't affected. But I can use the x and y functions for that as well. So here, I want to. Do x of true anomaly and y of true anomaly. And I want to do that for the line as well. And now I no longer need these statements. And the animation still works. So now I've set up formulas for x and y in one place. And notice that I can pass to these functions an array, a variable, a 360 element array, or a two element array. And it works in all cases. So I have generalized functions. So what if I change the eccentricity to 0 0.5? I get a more circular ellipse. And as I mentioned before, I could set up a form to accept these inputs. I prefer to do it in code. If I set 0 as the eccentricity, I'll get a circle. And notice I have a circle for the shape, the point, and the vector. Zero point nine is a much more centric ellipse, and you can see that here. And if I change the semi major axis and change the eccentricity back to 0.8, I get a much bigger ellipse. And the animation still works for the modified shape.
Now I'm going to show you how to generate multiple web series. So I don't want to define these parameters globally. And I want to set the figure size to a default of 6 by 6. So in order to maintain the integrity of the shapes, I need to define fixed axes. So I'll make it minus 10 by 10 for x, minus 10 by 10 for y. And so I need to be careful not to pick an ellipse with a semi-major axis greater than 20. And now I want to define a routine to plot an ellipse. And this will take as inputs a, e, and theta. And this calls a plot function to plot x based on a, e, theta, and y based on a, e, theta which means I'm going to need to define A, E, and theta arguments for X and Y. And R. And that's actually pretty simple to do. Now when I invoke this plot ellipse function, I define the semi-major axis as an argument, the eccentricity as an argument, and then the theta array as an argument like I did before. And I can very easily plot a second ellipse. So in this case, I want the semi-major axis to be 6 and the eccentricity to be 0. So this will be a circle. And you can see I have now both a circle and an ellipse. Now I'd like to animate those as well. And to do that, I actually need another point and another line. So I'll call the original point, point one. I'll create a point two. The original line is line one. I'll create a line two. And then the animate routine needs to return point one, point two line one and line two. Now I want to go back to setting the x coordinates and y coordinates discreetly because I'm going to be using them several times. And so I'd like to define the semi-major axis and the eccentricity once. Theta is always the true anomaly that was passed into the animate function. And here's the formula for the y coordinate, which just invokes the y function. Now, if I got really clever, I'd find a way to specify these inputs once for the plot of the ellipse and the x coordinate and y coordinate. But I'll leave that to you. And now I want to set point 1 to the x coordinate, comma y coordinate. And line 2 to the same x coordinate and y coordinate. Now if I copy all this code, I can change the semi-major axis to a 6. In the second instance, these interested to a 0. And this is point 2 and line 2. Now when I run this code, I get both shapes and both animations. Now notice in the case of a circle, it's nice circular motion. The angle is sweeping through 360 degrees, one degree at a time at a constant rate. The sweep on the ellipse, though, isn't constant, but the angle is sweeping at a constant rate. So 
if this were orbital motion to be correct for the circle, it's actually wrong for an ellipse. And we're going to fix this in a later part when we talk about Kepler's second law. Now, if I want to, I can advance the true anomaly for one of the shapes. And then I get motion like this. And notice these actually are now 90 degrees apart. So the primary thing I want you to take away from this part is this equation. It's the proper equation of polar coordinates for an ellipse centered at the right focus. And this gives you the length of length r from the focus to the point on the ellipse given an angle theta. If you increment theta in equal increments over time, equal time periods, you get the right motion for a circle, but the wrong motion for an ellipse, which I showed you on the last slide. These two equations are also important. If you're plotting points with polar coordinates, you don't need these equations. If you're plotting rectangular coordinates, you do. And lastly, I want you to understand how to write your own Python code that uses these equations. The Python code is pretty simple. Once you have your own code, you can modify it, play around with parameters, and so on. If you're studying orbital dynamics, Python is a great resource. You can verify answers to problems you're working on. If the motions don't look right, then the math of the code is probably wrong. If you have the math wrong and you're doing this for a living, the consequences can be devastating. The professionals use MATLAB or MathCAD. It's very expensive. I think Python is a good alternative because it's free.